Hello, everyone, and welcome to Enhancing Student Outcomes Through Increased Access to Learning Materials, a Times Higher Education webinar in partnership with Perlego. My name is Alistair Lawrence. I'm the Head of Branded Content at THE, and I will be chairing today's discussion. I'm delighted to be joined by an uh, expert panel from around academia and industry, which includes Matt East, who is Learning Product Manager at Perlego, Kate Lindsay, who is Senior Pre Vice President for Academic Services for EMEA at Higher Ed Partners, Kirsty Kiesebrink, who is Dean for Edu Educational Innovation at the University of Aberdeen, and Elise Wakelin, who is Head of Department at Nottingham Law School at Nottingham Trent University. There will be an opportunity to put questions to the panel during the final five or 10 minutes of the hour that we have scheduled. So please feel free to write any questions that you have in the Zoom box and we will answer as many as we can beforehand, before we go. Access to a wide range of learning materials is essential for student success because it enables students and instructors to deepen their knowledge and have a holistic learning experience. However, fears of prohibitive textbook costs and lack of access to digital resources can often lead to students not getting the outcomes they deserve from their university experience. So before we begin, I'd like to hand over to Matt, who is Learning Manager at Playgo, who will give us a brief overview of how Playgo are working with the sector to address this. Matt, over to you. Thank you very much, Alistair. Um, can I just confirm that you can see my screen? Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, so hi everyone, um, as Alistair said, my name's Matt. Um, I am Learning Product Manager over at Palego and delighted to be on this panel uh, today. Thank you very much. So many of you may not have heard of Palego. Um, and to summarize, as others have done for us, uh, we're kind of known as the Spotify for textbooks. So Palego has been around as a, as a company for probably about six years. Um, we work with uh, both direct to consumer, so working with directly with students and learners from across the world. I think it's something like over 180 countries now. Um, but we also work directly with universities as well. Um, and you may be wondering, well, what's you know what's so special and what's different here? And I think to, to summarize that, I'd like to go back to actually the, the, the problems that we're seeking to solve. Um, now, you may or may not be involved in the purchase of textbook content within your institutions, but there's a number of different things that become quite challenging for universities here and for students and for academics. Um, so many platforms that you may use at your institution actually only offer content on a one, one by one basis. That means that the university purchases effectively a seat for individual students to access that content. Now that can come with a range of different issues from um, where that content is accessible, how it's available, if it's available offline, how long students have access to that. And I think critically for me, concurrency, how many students at one time can actually access that piece of content. And I'm sure you've all been in that situation where you have a core text for your course, you tell students to go to the library, they all run to the library to get the book and within five minutes, all of the books are gone. Well, that's that problem still exists within a digital space. From a purchasing perspective, actually buying and acquiring this content can be hugely time consuming, can be very challenging and can absorb a huge amount of time from, from the library and from um, collaboration with academics. Um, and those are some of the core problems that we're trying to solve. So what, where Palego is different is we offer unlimited access to over a million textbooks spanning both um, academic and non-academic subject areas. We work with over 3,000 uh, 3, publishers and over 900 various topics now. Um, so students can really you know do exactly what they would have expected to have done in a, in a physical library that element of sort of serendipitous discovery um, and that's one of the things I'm, I'm really proud of with with uh from working for this for this organization but i think what we're, what takes this further is that because of this this kind of unified experience and this one-stop shop for for content and for resources we've been able to focus on how we can provide students with a really valuable learning environment for their um, for their own independent study, for their, their knowledge uh, understanding, their digestion, their synthesis. Um, and some of the ways that we've been doing that um, focus around things like customization and accessibility. We've, we were constantly releasing features um, to improve the accessibility for our students from including dyslexic friendly fonts to read aloud capabilities to full reflowable content. We've got a number of different study tools that students can make use of, you know, from basic things like notes and highlights, but moving further on to collating collections of resources through reading lists, um, using notebook functionality to bring all of their different thoughts and perspectives together around specific subject areas or, or topics. Um, and finally, this really this fits within the systems that you would use within your organization, such as the learning management system and library management systems. 
We work with over 200 universities um, internationally. So some universities adopt this on quite small numbers for an individual course or um, for a specific group of students, you know, even down to those who access um, different services across the university, but also up to um, you know, the full university experience. And we do that across you know, many different countries as, as um, you can see on the screen. But I think the most important thing to mention here is what students actually think and how students think that this actually helps them. So I'm not going to read through um, the, the numbers on screen, but I think the most important thing for me is that you know, students are coming back to this tool. They find it incredibly valuable. And most importantly, they feel that this has actually helped them study more effectively um, using Palego. These stats are from a, um, a survey we conduct every year with our, with our users. Um, I think it was over 2,000 students that actually responded. So, you know, some, some positive numbers there. Um, if you'd like to hear any more about Palego uh, during this session or after, um, you can just go to our website, palego.com slash institutions, um, where you can get in touch and find out more. And now I will stop talking. Great. Thank you very much, Matt. I'd like to pick up on a, a couple of points that you mentioned there and also to the, the main thrust of the discussion today, which is the the need to um, increase access to learning materials so that that can benefit students and educators in a in a variety of ways. I'd firstly like just to, to go to the panelists so I could I could get their thoughts on what the main challenges are that, that they experience. Um, Kirsty, perhaps we could come to you first. You could tell us a little about your work at Aberdeen and particularly how the the innovation part of your job comes into play here when you're looking at, you know, what does the modern student journey look like now and what access does it need to learning materials in order to, to be the best it can be? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I think there's the modern student journey, but there's also the modern student and they're a bit different from when I was a student um, and their approach is a bit different. Um, one of the things that we're very proud of in Aberdeen um, is um, we set up before COVID um, uh, what we call our on-demand system. So we basically took our degrees apart and students can decide to take a single course. So this is for, it's mostly postgraduate still at the moment, but shouldn't thinking, I don't know if I'm at that level, I don't want to sign up to whole masters, they take a single course. And then they think, I quite like that, I'll do another little course. And then they can literally pay as you go to build up a degree. And with the the sort of older system of university that was kind of like I don't know if you remember when you went to uni you got this reading list which you promptly gave to your grandparents who were like yes we'll buy this book for you and that book and off you went with a big stack of books but because people aren't necessarily investing straight away and saying I'm doing a degree they're coming in in different ways some through CPD there's just a different approach we want to get things in bite-sized bits we want the right thing right now and I want the most up to date and then in this next course which I might not take for another year I need a different resource then. So th there's just this more flexible approach to education, I think now, and a different pathway through it and more of this build as you go, which means we as universities um, need to support that better. So there's not quite the same rigidity of an undergraduate degree is three or four years and a master, and then you, you follow through in a rigid line. So it's that more variable pathway, I think, is one of the key things I think has changed. Um, and we've got to change how we're providing access and resources for students um, there. I think the other thing that I have never considered when I was a student is students want to see reading lists before they come. <laughs> they want to start looking at things. And actually, if we're using electronic, that's so much easier. They're not going to have to go and find a bookshop and, or a library and get that. They can actually just go on and start reading the reading list. And it gives them a really good idea of the, the level we're teaching at, what the content's going to be. So that whole journey just is very different. It doesn't have the same start and stop points anymore. Um, so that's really shown a lot of challenges for us that we're we're trying to to work with the students and, and with various suppliers to to support that. It's, it's interesting you you've taken a like say a pay as you go model and what sounds like a, a stackable model as well in order to give people greater flexibility not just over what they're studying but when they're studying it as well. I was wondering what the the main barriers you face that that persist when you are trying to give people access to resources. Um, I think. For, for us, um, well, although we are a campus-based university, we have a huge number who study with us completely rural and distant at all times. We have a beautiful library. Our students don't use our library in order to access books anymore. They use it as a very different space. So actually, um, that accessibility is that they want to be able to do the, they want to look up this resource on their phone when they're on the bus going somewhere or when they're in their bedroom. That, you know, and they don't want to have to delay by having to go to the library to check a book out. 
you know they want to do that all digitally um we have students also studying from all over the world um so we need to be able to have that they can get these resources and download them so they've then got them so they can use them when the internet's not great i have students who are who are studying with me in war zones um which i just blows my mind that they're even maintaining this and in zones with natural disasters so they download resources they have them available for when the internet's not working and they can carry on um, engaging with those materials um so those sort of accessibility things and then you get into the the issues of actually being able to sit and read a textbook especially some of those big heavy ones you know it, and it's somebody else's book quite often because they're too expensive that somebody else's you can't annotate it you can't you can't don't ever fold that corner over on the page. Suddenly they've got their own digital copy of things. They can they can put bookmarks on it, they can highlight. And we know there's lots of research showing that that active engagement whilst reading it really improves our retention, but also our understanding of what we're reading. Um, so those things, as well as then being able to, you know, have the book read to you. I still like having things read to me. It's just a really nice way. I will do my focus reading, but actually just having it read to me also just helps reinforce messaging. Um, and by moving into more digital sources of, of reading materials, we have so many more options of how we interact, how we use it, and how we retain the knowledge that we've gained from it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Kate, can I come to you next, please, to talk a bit about that, to pick up what Kirsty was saying about the remote access and the need for, for quality online delivery. How have you found the, the the challenges of meeting those needs with with the work that you do at Higher Ed Partners? Well, I mean, I've been working fully online education for about five six years now, and um, I work across a range of universities in the UK, Africa, um, Iberia, and a lot of what I've discovered really echoes what what Kirsty is saying. Accessibility is key now. It's not just something that's on the side and is an afterthought. It needs to be embedded in all of our strategic planning around supporting students to access education, to access the resources they need. For example, a lot of our students are in South Africa where they may have up to eight hours a day of load shedding, so no access to power in that time. So they've got to find other ways to study and that they have to be able to download those materials on their devices. So um, absolutely echo the challenge around accessibility. I think as well, there's there's quite a bit of work to do in changing um, mindsets of those who are designing learning for students and, and teaching in that a, a textbook isn't just a textbook anymore, very much like what Kirsty was saying. It's something that you can build a learning experience around and within through, you know, getting students to annotate, to use use those resources as a tool and also, you know, scaffold that reading. It's not just go and read this chapter, which is what you used to get on a reading list, isn't it? You get your reading list, read this chapter, read this chapter. Why? Why should they read this chapter? You know, you know, what's it? How's it going to help them with their assessment? How's it going to help them um, apply what they're learning to to their work and, and you know, or their future job? And I, that is something I'm finding very much um, is a demand now, actually, from fully, especially fully online learners who are often in full time employment, um, mature category. They want to make use of what they're learning instantly. So if you can build that into the activities around the resources and um, within the resources and not have them be off on a separate bit of paper somewhere. I think that that is a, a great way to enable student access and, and applying that learning. When you do have a mixed cohort like that, you know, some students who are working full time and looking to apply things very quickly, other students who are perhaps taking a more traditional uh, bachelor's, master's route through and, it, and it's more linear. Is there a need to like to really sort of diversify the the ways in which learning resources can be applied to different types of learning. So you've got your traditional, perhaps, essay and exam based models of assessment, but then you've also got project based learning, perhaps, you know, vertically streamed groups of students so that they can learn from one another. Does that, really that, that just puts more demand on people supplying digital um, resources in order to, to meet all of those needs? I think it, not, ne not necessary, not if it's thought about well enough in advance um it's you know a lot of effort has to go into the design and once you've got a clear picture you, you those things generally just i find just fall into place so for our courses for example with our universities they're fully asynchronous 
um, the students can study at their own pace within a set time period. So as long as those resources are available to them throughout that period of study and afterwards as part as a student of a university, they'll be able to succeed. Um, I think the challenge is really more with, with the suppliers uh, in terms of being able to develop more models that are more open and that allow students to have that, you know, um, what did you say, Matt? You called it, um, it was a great phrase, serendipitous, serendipitous discovery. Exploration. Yeah, so that's, you know, being able to go with those models really help those students. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, Matt, I'll give you a right to reply immediately with uh, that. The um, In order to sort of anticipate those different types of student journeys, and you, you mentioned in your, in your opening about sort of, you know, making allowances for particular special needs when you're using dyslexia-friendly fonts and things like that. What are the main queries that keep coming back to you from your university partners about, you know, what are the needs that, that need to be met around accessibility that they struggle with, do you think? Um, I think the first thing I would say is that accessibility, I'm going to echo what Kate said here, accessibility cannot and should not ever be an afterthought. It needs to be absolutely baked into the DNA of, of systems like ours. Um, that is absolutely crucial. I think the main thing that we're hearing at the moment and actually have been for the last couple of years is that the, the original work that kind of drove a lot of focus around accessibility um, changes legislation fairly recently um, has set a benchmark for expectations, but the institutions are starting to see and hear from their students far more how the functionality and capability that's been embedded to meet those requirements is actually being utilized by you know, far more people um, than, than initially expected. And actually, I'm gonna go, go back to the example that Kirsty gave. Um, We've, re we've released features around, we call it read aloud or text to speech. So students can, as you, you know, expect, digest a chapter while walking the dog. I actually did that this morning and it's absolutely brilliant. And, you know, I think that that, that is the kind of thing that we absolutely need to be focusing a lot of effort on as, as a supplier, but in partnership with our, with our universities. So that we're, we're not just building, you know, tokenistic features or things that, that, you know, um, that look good on, on, on prospectuses or marketing material, but things that actually really help students get to the nub of their learning in the most effective way possible. Great, thank you. Um, Elise, I come to you to ask how all of this applies to a speciality like law, because on one hand you have a huge opportunity to engage with um, digital materials that can be quickly updated and, um, and tailored to what students need, but at the same time, to go back to you know what Kate mentioned is that about getting people who might be working and, and learning alongside study in that case they have very different requirements from their learning materials for a specialist and even more so in, in the case of something like legal studies have you seen a lot of does it feel like you're still in flux in terms of meeting the demand for what students want with digital materials or have some patterns emerged that tend to work well for your cohorts no thanks very much for the question so yeah we have a, a whole host of different um courses that I oversee in my role. So we do have our full time to do, well, I guess would probably be the traditional route, three, four year degree students that are generally on campus. Um, but we also um, have a range of courses that are distance learning courses, which um, the students come in and see us four times a year. So they have uh, teaching weekends and the rest of the study is kind of at home. Um, around the, their personal commitments and we also have a number of um, apprenticeships um, students with us as well so we've got a real host of students so absolutely each of these different groups of students different need in terms of accessing uh, these resources um, I hate to use the word COVID pandemic, but I think that it's, it, it, it was probably a bit of a um, kind of a driver for kind of looking at increased access for digital resources for our students when they weren't on campus anymore. They couldn't get to the library. So the students that couldn't afford to go out and buy all the textbooks was, were relying on maybe the paper copies or the limited number of digital copies that the library held. They, they no longer had that that easy access to the library. So we, we have been looking at increased digital uh, resources. So we do have partnerships with, with some uh, publishers where our students can um, have access to um, resources um, across all different um, areas um, in the legal field. The one thing which I think is really important, and it does draw upon a little bit um, 
thinking about some of the disabilities and maybe different personal preferences for learning is that although every module that, that we deliver has a, a core textbook um, within that we also offer a range of alternative resources that students may prefer to look at or may wish to also look at and I think that's really important because I mean I remember the days when I was a student that if the core textbook I didn't get on with you know I had bought the textbook at the beginning of the year I went and you know stood in the queue at the bookshop it became a very good doorstop and it just wasn't opened and I wasn't really given very many alternatives in terms of other resources that I could look at so with this ability to kind of have access to digital resources is really allowing us to kind of recommend to students well this is the core text or this is the core recommended reading however there are also these alternatives and um, so it's really giving access to a wide range of resources for students, allowing for their personal preferences and style, but also taking account um, things such as the disabilities where, whereby certain texts or run resources may be more appropriate for our different types of learners. And that, to that point about creating, altern creating the provision of alternative textbooks, what feedback loop do you have with your cohorts to see how popular those are in comparison to the core textbook? Um, so, I mean, we've had really positive feedback from things like our student forums, our course committees, whereby we speak to the students and ask them how they're finding access to these different resources. Um, are they noticing that it's improving their, their studies and they're saying that it's allowing them to explore alternative uh, resources that they wouldn't have previously had access to? Um, so, yeah, I think it's also allowing them to, to have, as I say, widen um, some of the things that they're looking at. And we're seeing that actually in assessments as well. So especially when we're thinking about some of our core based assessments, we are seeing evidence that students are engaging in that wider, those wider resources um, just by looking at their bibliographies. Um, I think we're, we're seeing that they are they are definitely making use of, of these, this greater access. Alistair, if I may come in on some of those points, um, I, I, I'm, I really agree, Elise, that, you know, actually giving students alternatives is 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 crucial now, actually. And one of the things we've we've found is that we provide recommendations on, you know, si similar resources that, that match similar chapters and bibliographic data and, and that type of thing. And actually feedback from the students who make use of that feature is that, you know, even if it's just taking a slightly different perspective or coming in from a slightly different angle, that can be, you know, that can just help just just nudge the understanding that a little bit more if there was hitting a kind of roadblock. Um, and I, th I think actually on, on the point you were just making around alternatives, the, the perspective of good in an alternative resource is in the eye of the beholder. One of the things that I've seen be really powerful um, is crowdsourcing, actually setting activities around collaboratively crowdsourcing different resources, particularly around not just you know, another textbook, but actually a different format entirely. And, you know, many students find a huge amount of content on YouTube that can be really valuable for introductory elements or just to explain something in a slightly different way. Those kind of initiatives and, and, and activities are really, really powerful. But Matt, in terms of the, the data that you're able to supply to your university partners, I mean, it's obviously it's a fine line to check, you don't really be too sort of big brotherish about it, but is, are there metrics that the university partners can look at on your platform that can give them a good indication of you know where the strongest uptake is what the most um, popular resources are yep absolutely um you'd, you'd, you'd expect that um and i think where what we've what we've observed with with our partners is the change in i'm going to say breadth of reading throughout the um throughout a, a student's journey so obviously this isn't just a linear path from you know undergraduate to final year undergrad to postgrad but the change that we can have, we have observed and, and that customers have fed back to us in, in how students who have this unlimited model change their practice around reading broader, reading different subject areas. Um, and again, you know, that's not universal, but it is, it is fascinating to see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, please, Kirsty, go ahead. I, I was going to come in. I think there's also something about um, this blending. I think when textbooks were books and then other materials were something else, it was like different areas of your learning but now that we're using digital resources then it blends straight into those youtube videos or the science article it's not such a big step for students to see that this is a different thing they're doing it's this is all just consuming information gathering it, it, and in some ways it's the same because you're doing it on the same device just different sources and one of the things um, i've got my students starting to do now where we do use textbooks 
um, is getting them to look up the authors of the different chapters and actually finding other work by that author. Um, and quite often they come back with YouTube and they're like, wow, this person's real. And I don't know where they thought <laughs> who was writing these books, but they either like they find them in real universities and they've got real YouTube. And, and quite often, obviously, the person's then giving a YouTube video about the topic that's in that book. And it really helps the students to just be like, this isn't just some dry old tomb that's already out of date. It, it brings it more alive. Um, so that's one of the things I, I love setting my students challenge of find other materials by these authors. that's not a book and, and off they go and they come back with some great resources. Great. Thank you. I, I wonder if there's a link there to the, the overall remit that, that the universities try for is to increase, increase the diversity of their cohorts and also retain perhaps minority representation or the, the um, uh, less well represented cohort um, demographics within their overall cohort. Obviously, you can't generalize too much across certain cohorts liking to learn a certain way. But, Kirsty, I just a follow up question. Do you think that breaking down those barriers and, and giving students a more holistic approach to learning, does it have ancillary benefits like building stronger student communities, helping people um, work together from different backgrounds, things like that? Yeah, I mean, I think as well as diversifying our cohorts, we have also making a huge effort to diversify our sources of knowledge um so we're really looking at when you know when you just had a, a paper textbook you kind of got a bit stuck and you kept using it year on year now with the digital it does encourage staff to be thinking right is this the right resource what other more diverse sources is there out there which i really does do think helps um students engage if the if the materials we're using reflects their experiences, their worldview, their cultures, it, that, you know, it instantly becomes more accessible to them. Um, so I think as part of that, it, and that's where these of the, the more digital resources available just makes it a bit quicker uh, and more, it's easier for staff to find those and also then to get students to help us find those um, diverse resources. And that I think builds the community, not just within the students, but it builds this idea that we are a learning community, including the staff in that community of we're all learning together we're trying to create these great resources uh, and getting students to tell us why that resource i think i think maybe it was kate you'd mentioned getting the students to go off and find and you know bring things back and that's it's fabulous when they can start doing that and just supplement the whole material and yeah i, I get great resources brought back into my course um and then i deliberately don't use them the next year because i want the next cohort of students to have that enjoyment of going and finding it for themselves um Great, thank you. Um, Kate, it, as far as building communities in that way, do you see a value in terms of it helping to appeal to more international cohorts or helping to retain international students when they're coming into that environment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're a global society now and fully online education is by nature, is it's transnational education. Our students are studying abroad at home you know so being able to bring in those global perspectives into a classroom is, is much easier on in an online environment than it is in an on-campus environment not to say that campuses aren't beautifully rich in terms of diversity a lot of the time but it's you know it's, it's easier to pull people together I love activities learning activities which ask students to go off and find resources from their local contexts and their countries and bring them back and share them with each other so like the crowdsourcing activities that matt mentioned and these are often some of the most popular activities for students and it helps them learn about each other and who's on their course and it that helps to build that sense of belonging and respect and community which is i think is really important and it is it is hard to develop that fully online but you can do it if you know if you approach it right and you design things right um yeah so i think bringing in and you know when we have amazing translation tools now like google lens and things like that it actually doesn't matter what language they bring those resources back with you, they're accessible to everyone now with the technologies we have okay, great thank you very much um at least i'd like to I'd ask you about the the challenge of managing staff workload within all of this we've had we've had plenty of great examples about how you can go out into the world and build and diversify your learning communities but this this perhaps creates a bit of a, a monster if you're not too careful, because if you have everybody who's super engaged and they're all feeding back resources, then does that put a renewed pressure on staff to have to decide, OK, well, what resources are we going to pick and how am I going to steer a path through this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things that obviously 
the staff is still kind of looking for that 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 core text as i said earlier on they're still kind of going to be having that central recommended or maybe one or two recommended resources um, but it does i think it allows them a lot more flexibility and freedom um, which actually I think they really enjoy having that creativity to be able to look at these alternative resources to really kind of make their sessions more interactive, as you say, to kind of get the students to engage with these different types of resources. Um, it, it does depend on, on, on the, the subject matter you're teaching as to how much you can do that. Obviously, I'm thinking there are going to be some some um, participants on the on this session that are thinking, well, I can't really do that because it's quite prescriptive what, what I have to cover on my course. There's going to be other courses where maybe the flexibility in terms of, of what you can do is, is quite different. And actually within law, it does vary between modules as to kind of how much flexibility you have. Some modules we have certain content we have to cover. And so we're just thinking, right, so how can we develop it by using different resources to kind of make it a bit more um interactive and get the students engaging in different activities um whereas other modules are much more um give the, give the the staff a, a lot more freedom in terms of what they're doing and um, so i think it's kind of really important when you're thinking about this, the staff workload when you're looking at this is to kind of give staff the the ideas and let them understand that the opportunity is there for them to kind of look at these more diverse diverse um, resources and opportunities that they can use with their students but it's kind of allowing the staff and kind of to take ownership of their own courses their own modules in terms of how they use them because i think to be too prescriptive i think would be really difficult and and how does that translate into when you're looking at things like assessment and building different types of assessment is that again something else where you have to you, you ultimately have to let staff decide but while working within us an agreed upon framework so yeah, so obviously we have an assessment strategy within our school. So obviously we have to ensure that across the module we have a across the courses that we do have a diverse range of assessments for, for students um, throughout the course and obviously at different points of the academic year as well. And that's obviously got to kind of have the over, you know, oversight of um, those of us that are, are running the, the courses. Um, but obviously we don't do that in isolation. We do that with close consultation with the with the staff that are teaching. It. And if a staff member comes to us and say, actually, I'm not sure if this is the current form of assessment, if that's actually the best form of assessment, we'd really like to look at changing or updating the assessment, then obviously we will we will work really closely with that team and see, okay, what's what what can we do? So although you've always got the overarching strategy for the course, um, I think that you're always going to be looking and to, to enhance and develop and listen to to the staff and what they want to do with their modules as well. I, I, when I've interviewed um, senior leaders from from a legal background previously, they've they've always made the point that with law there's a very specific need to assess the things that students going on to become solicitors or barristers or, or or other particular jobs within a legal field there are two types of knowledge that they need to have there is the knowledge that they would be expected to instantly recall as part of their work and then there, there is the knowledge that they would be expected to know how to go and look up and verify and work alongside that the the type of study that we've been talking about in, in this session is quite interesting i think because you're you're every panelist is talking about giving students more freedom to navigate and more freedom to to draw on different types of resources so within that i mean I, I imagine for law you're also you're cognizant of the fact that there are they are facing different types of assessment and they are going to be assessed on different levels of knowledge and, and recalling them in different ways yeah absolutely so a lot of our modules are assessed actually um in two different types of assessments so one will often be testing that that legal knowledge that you referred to and that kind of that first point and then the second one will be usually testing um how they apply the skill and so this will some of the so i mean i'm going to give the example of public law as, as a first year module that we offer that's with them um, that's paired with research skills so obviously it fits really nicely with kind of the conversations we're having today so as part of that module they have to do coursework whereby they're obviously having to show their knowledge of the law but they're also having to demonstrate their research skills their ability to to use these different resources that we've been talking about today to make sure that they know how to reference them properly and so most of our core modules that we have within the school have these skills attached to them as well. And so having access to these wider range of resources really kind of allows the students to engage 
for both the, the knowledge and for that skill side of things because there's so many different resources available for both sets of, of, of assessment that we do with our students. Okay, great, thank you. Matt, as a provider, are you asked to integrate with different types of open and closed book assessments? Um, at the moment, that's not something that we've actually had a lot of feedback on, to be honest. Um, I think the most important thing here is that we're, cre we're creating a platform that allows the scaffold that is required so that actually learners have a, a seamless user experience. Um, there's been, you know, we have had queries in the past around, well, why can't we, you know, pre-build quizzing and exams into 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 the content we provide and i mean the fundamental answer is that that removes agency from the academic to be completely honest um so i'm kind of against that <laughs> to be completely blunt um i think it's really important that we you know we are continuing to be really conscious of actually the environment that students are learning in and that teachers are teaching in and that we're all designing in um so as long as we're adding you know value to enable that kind of activity to be to be owned either by students or by academics that's got to be our priority um i wanted to actually come back on a point if you don't mind just just on the on the point of um diversity i think there's been some really valid really valuable points around you know, students bringing their own their own perspectives and their own, own cultures into into the learning environment and and you know that kind of the impact that can have on belonging um and i think that you know we are in a global society we are, we are in a global learning environment now um so that becomes increasingly more important but i think actually it's increasingly more valuable for students as well when when you know we gain the opportunity to integrate into their into their courses in an effective way and an area that i've seen work really well on the topic on assessment around this is actually related to critical appraisal so you know we teach a lot of we teach students a lot of skills and core competencies um you know, for specific degrees but there, there are those soft skills that are often referred to criticality is one of them and actually seeing some fabulous examples of the kind of things we've been talking about you know find alternative perspectives from your own background or cultures write a critical analysis of this and then building some peer marking or peer assessment into that kind of activity to again sort of bubble up all of this knowledge with layers of, of feedback and, and, and appraisal super super valuable and that then helps for future development when you're diversifying resources for the next cohort so yeah something i, I would love to see more of actually okay thank you um i'm Kirsty, I just like to go back to a point that you made earlier about the the use of the physical space of the library and how the, the demand that it's being used very differently on campus. This does link in a way to students with differing levels of access. And when you when you hear phrases like digital poverty, that's not just about not being able to afford a phone or a laptop or having to choose between one or the other. It's also about having the time and the space to have access to use comprehensive online resources. So Building on an online resource is, is clearly critical and, and central to what everybody's trying to do here. But beyond the, that, for the wider community, how important is it to maintain spaces where people can access that on their own time, um, but still have a locus where they can come to do it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important. Um, I, I think um, I have this vision where I would like to say that every university in the world gets together and says, do you know what? If there's a student who lives near your university but is studying at a different one wants to come in and just use your space, that's okay. So we basically share out our spaces better. So, you know, you could study anywhere and you just go to your local university and you can take your laptop along and have a, I mean, I think that for me is how the universities have to develop. We need to become a sector that actually works together. Because I do think, I, you know, it's really hard for students sitting in their bedrooms trying to study balancing laptops on a tea tray. Um, and I know like within Aberdeen University, we're really open to that. So I think libraries have already got that in place in some ways. You know, you can take your, your student card and go into other libraries around the UK, but I'd like to see it much wider and it not just be the library space, but it be the campus. So those physical buildings are open to anyone to come in and use um, uh, and and have that. I think we, we want to have more sort of desk spaces that are docking, sort of just come along, stick your computer down, that's your workspace for today that's fine um but yeah if i can get every university in the world and colleges and schools all to link together and say yep they're all open that would be amazing that sounds like a job for gist to me <laughs> um anyone who just got the call make it so yeah. um kate what are your thoughts on that in the way that you, you obviously you're dealing with 100 percent digital delivery and do you hear anything from from student feedback about still needing some kind of um 
uh, physical space in order to be able to, to oh, study yeah. effectively. Yeah, absolutely. And um, hardship grants uh, for fully online places often cover being able to help you find a space, rent out a space, get a desk, those kind of things. It doesn't have to be, you know, equipment or fees. It, it, it stretches to other. I, I remember a previous institution I worked for, we bought a generator for a student um, in Kenya so, they, you know, they could access electricity and study. So it, it is really important. I think just as important as the space, though, is the access to the internet. So another call out for just, you know, to widen edge your own um, around towns and cities and areas. So, you know, you don't have to go to an educational institution to to log on. You can you can you know, you can go to your local Starbucks or or museum or wherever and get onto your university network and access all you know everything that you need to through that. I think that that's quite important as well. Okay, thank you. And Elise, have you seen any change in the the spaces in which your students spend time online together when they are building digital communities? I mean, I've I've heard it seems like every type of story, every type of attempt from universities to try and to try and build online spaces for students, only for them to probably pivot and carry on and, and do their own thing on a different platform or something like that. So it's it's not something you're ever going to be able to control one hundred percent, but should it be another consideration alongside making resources available on a bigger scale? Yeah, so something which we did is um, we created sort of Microsoft Teams spaces for students. So we did it um, so that way the students had a, an online space that they could meet to discuss uh, questions that they might have about that, a particular module. Um, so they could kind of almost use it as a bit of a peer support um, network um, in terms of being able to kind of raise questions that they might have. Um, and the module leaders would, would would pop in occasionally and kind of if there were kind of themes or questions that were coming up and staff would also pop in, but it was mostly student led. Um, and we found that, you know, it has peaks and troughs in terms of its use. And as you say, you often have it that the students better set up their own WhatsApp groups and kind of have, have their separate conversations and things um but we found for those students that were maybe um feeling a bit isolated or maybe struggling to have someone to say to reach out to to ask those questions peers to ask those questions for um th those kind of online spaces that we've really been uh, really supportive to help those students they've also been really useful for uh, students such as those commuting students that maybe aren't on campus physically as much um, and also uh, the distance learning students um, that, that we have that are obviously trying to mostly study and they can't necessarily have a phone call with someone at three o'clock in the afternoon or to meet for a coffee with a friend because that's when they're, 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 they're still doing office hours or doing the school run and things like that so kind of having these online platforms where they can put questions and they can kind of talk at whatever time suits them Oh, in order to enable that asynchronous model, right? yeah, I understand. Yeah. Um, Matt, in terms of the uh, the platform that you provide, what's the the most in demand asset? Is it the in addition to the resources themselves? Is it the the interoperability? Is it the you know the shareability of resources between students for peer studies? I mean, do you see any new patterns emerging there? I think that's a that's an interesting question. I could answer it in many different ways. Um, I think that for students, the thing that we're that we're hearing more and more demand for is is greater capability to um, build out independent study activity. So you know we've we've spent a lot of uh, because of the uniqueness of our platform, because students have you know all of the stuff that they can um, they can access. Actually, being able to bring their thinking and their ideation together across all of the resources into one place, organize that structure at that, synthesize that to help prepare for assessments becomes increasingly more important. Um, I'd say far more so than, than when you have product content in isolation, which is I think one of the big problems that we still face for, for students actually, you know, the, the environments that they're in vary dramatically, the systems they use vary dramatically. Um, so from a student perspective, yeah, absolutely. That's that's the kind of biggest area. How can we continue to build out the functionality to help students bring their knowledge together into one space? From an institution, the the, the most important thing and the thing that we we you know we we hear you know all the time is how can we deepen the interoperability with university systems? Um, I think this phrase applies to both universities but also to students. They shouldn't have to bend to the tech 
the tech should work for those requirements. And so, you know, working within learning management systems, working within library platforms, working within data systems, working for the way that students want to work, those are those are the factors that we really need to consider so that we're we're doing we're not trying to change behavior or practice from an organization, but we're, you know, we're, we're navigating through. Okay, great. Thank you very much. We've, um, we're into the last 15 minutes or so. We've had a couple of questions from the audience already. If anyone in the audience does have extra questions for the panelists, please just drop them in the chat box and we'll try and get through as many as we can. We, we've got a couple here from Lawrence Mosby who asks, how does the online situation affect assessing student understanding so that employers and others can trust that students are really competent? I, I guess um, this, this goes back to the point, I think perhaps at least we were talking about earlier, where there are expectations that students will have certain knowledge upon graduating going into the workforce. And those are, that's the employability knowledge that employers require. And then also the, the soft skills that Matt referenced just now, those are the employability skills that people are looking for. Is it, it are you having to, you know, build that into your online delivery and your, and your online assessment? Yeah, absolutely. So we have, as I said, for, we have uh, multiple points of assessment when we're looking at those kind of those soft skills. Um, so we have a number of assessments within our um, kind of assessment strategy that focuses on things such as oral presentation skills. So in, in legal education, something called mooting, which is like more corporate um, submissions. So um, testing both the students' knowledge of the law and also doing um, their, their presentation skills and kind of their, their core etiquette and things like that and that can be done both on campus and online so obviously we were in a position whereby we had to do that online through such things such as teams and so we were able to replicate um, essentially what the courts were doing at the time by doing kind of virtual sessions with the students um, but now um, we do them back in person and now, now that we're able to do so. So we could we kind of we were able to adapt those types of assessments to ensure that those soft skills were being developed by our students with the online um, um, kind of requirements as well. OK, thank you. Uh, uh, Kate and Kirsty, how much is the is the employability a factor for when you are building curriculum and assessment and using digital resources to do it? It's absolutely key it's at the heart of um who our learners are they often you know they're they're already in full-time employment they're looking to undertake a degree to either advance their career or make a career change it's, so they're very very focused on the employability aspect and with the huge rise in like degree apprenticeships as well you have to embed employability throughout the curriculum so you're looking at resources that aren't just you know texts or papers you're looking at um, regulations <coughs> professional standards and finding ways to engage students with those because they can be a little bit dry but ways to engage students with those um through sort of the tools that we've been we've been talking about today I think when we're looking at you know being able to prove students are competent to employers I think we should just kind of trust that students want to learn and they want to improve and design assessments that support students to be as successful as possible and that's exactly the same on campus as it is online online has nothing to do with that whatsoever it's about designing good fair authentic assessment and you know if we're going to move into a chat about chat gpt if chat gpt can answer the assessment then you should probably just let chat gpt answer the assessment i would say um authentic assessment is key right mm -hmm. we all know that but it is human effort and I think the real challenge that we have with delivering authentic assessment, especially at scale, you know, I've got modules with three, 400 students on them. H how do we do that? How do we do that without breaking faculty and marking processes and everything? And that that's something I'm interested in looking at at the moment. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, um, chat GPT has succeeded previously, I think Brexit and the pandemic as something that will inevitably get mentioned at every single conversation we have during our webinars. So um, Kirsty, is, as Kate said, obviously, there are these things where you, you look at advances in, in technology in a way that it, it disrupts how people work and the type of work that they can submit. There's inevitably going to be a period of disruption and a period of flux where where assessors and educators adapt to this. Do you think that it is it is simply a, an ongoing process where curriculum needs to be refined and assessment needs to be refined to to anticipate and uh, mitigate it? Yeah, I mean, I guess from my point of view, um, Chat GPT, I think, agreeing with what Kate says, if we have got robust assessments, which we should already have, 
it really shouldn't be a challenge. Um, I do get at the very early stage um, lower levels where you might just be testing knowledge. Chat GPT can give you the perfect answer when it's just looking for knowledge. It might still get it wrong, but it can potentially give the perfect knowledge. But as we go up those levels and that, you know, when we're starting to say this is about now critically thinking, synthesizing, evaluating, Chat GPT can't do it. That's not to say that the Chat GPT version, whatever, won't be able to start doing those things. But we shouldn't be afraid of that. That's the workspace that our graduates are going into. They're going to work with those tools. The, I mean, I don't know how many of us complain about how much of our job is wasted doing routine, silly things that take too much time. Well, if the computer can do that for me, that's great. I can use more time doing creative, critical thinking, using my brain. And I think it's the same for our students. We're preparing them for a workplace and a society that that tool is there. Um, so, yeah, we are going to have to adapt. There is still some areas and pockets where people have resisted. And, and maybe this is for us the tool that will get them to move along the sort of path that I think we've all been going on. That authentic assessment is, is the key to this. And it's also the key to when we say, how will employer trust our graduates? Well, I think that's the point is, why did you trust before when we just said they have a whole load of knowledge? That, that doesn't actually make them fit to do the job. What we're now doing is, look, they can demonstrate how they've done this, which is a skill you want them to do in their job. They've now got a portfolio of assessments that is really doing real live proper tasks. Um, so I think we're producing much more competent graduates than we ever have in the past because of these challenges. And we're so aware of working with those tools. Okay. Thank you very much. We've had another a question about uh, delivering authentic assessment at scale. Is it, I, I imagine something that just has to be ad addressed by faculty and, and by institution. I mean, Kate, do you have anything else to add about sort of the meeting the problem of, of delivering authentic assessment in scale? I'll just come back to me in a few months on that when I've looked, yeah, because I'm doing piece of work at the moment. It is a challenge, but I think, I think we've created problems ourselves as a higher education sector like especially when we went all modular on everything and everything became modules and you know it's it could be much easier to deliver authentic assessment you know with a lot of you if it's at program level and you're not having like two or three or four points of assessment every module like in a master's what would that that could be 80 points of assessment for a master's if you just keep doing mini assessments in every module it's mad you know that's burdensome on students and it's awful for faculty but having a you know that program level where you can show how you're developing as a learner and you're building those skills and putting those into portfolios i think that i think that's a real opportunity to enable authentic assessment for for larger cohorts and i think there is also an opportunity to look at the power that ai can provide us not in terms of you know replacing anyone's work but in terms of how it can enable um processes to become more streamlined so we can put more effort into providing good feedback so yeah I think that there's a few there's a few things that we need to look at and we might need to break some higher education um regulations and policies and enable to get, to get to sounds get. exciting um at least you have something to add on this yeah no I just wanted to just add slightly to what Kate was saying and sort of the importance I think when you're looking at authentic assessment um she mentioned kind of the idea of almost scaffolding what you're doing at different levels so kind of the idea of of introducing different types of assessment but then developing kind of how you're using that type of assessment as you get further into to the course for the students so kind of allowing them build their the skills that they need um, and scaffold it through their course I think it's really important for authentic assessment as well Okay, thank patchworking you. a program level is a is a model. Yeah, really like that. Um, I just wanted to touch on one point that was raised. I, I, I knew we were going to discuss Chat GPT at one point. Um, it was it was only a matter of time. There seems to be a lot of um, reaction to this, quite understandably, from across the sector, but actually quite a lot of reaction in quite a worrying way, if I'm honest. Um, seeing seeing a lot of institutions who are you know, create policies around not using it and all this kind of stuff, you know, which it, which I think as as other panelists have said, is is it actually, to be honest, I think it's, it's quite naive. It's, it's the world that we're living in. You know, this is not something we're going to escape. And actually, there's a lot of there's a lot of evil. There's a lot of bad that can come from this, but there's also a lot of good. And I think Kate touched on the points that, you know, this could, and as we've seen from AI in general, this can unblock you know many challenging elements of our of our life and our society to enable us to focus on the things that actually robots can't do yet 
Um, and I think that universities need to be mindful that this isn't going to go away and they can't put in a AI detection tool and, and hope that all, you know, that's the solution to all the problems. We've actually got to, we've got to think about this again. And, you know, models around authentic assessment are, are a great example and there are others, but, you know, just a word of caution from what I'm observing across the sector, there's, there's a lot of reaction that is not necessarily going to be helpful. Okay. Thanks, Pat. Uh, Kirsty, over to you. Yeah, I was just going to say, I totally agree with that, that um, we shouldn't be looking at focusing on detection, prevention, these sort of things. Chat GPT at the moment is a distinct and separate thing. It's going to be in Word. It's going to be in yeah, behind absolutely. Google. It's going to be everywhere. So we need <clears> to move on. And I think it comes back to, I guess what we were sort of saying at the beginning, it's about making, there's so much information that is accessible now, way more. I mean, it's just the 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 world is full of stuff and our students have to navigate that and tools like this help them navigate it quicker and, and we need it because we you know one of the maybe positives and negatives of lots and lots of digital resources there's lots of it and trying to work your way through it is impossible and we need this sort of computer technology that will help us navigate through um so yeah i think we just we go with it and buy more time for creativity is what i say it's worth noting that there were similar fears when word processors were introduced in higher education. Um, you know, the fact that it will make, mean that people can write quicker, that was also a fear and it's going to transform higher education. I'm not saying that it's completely comparable, but, you know, just to remember where, where we have been before. Okay, thank you. We, we've got about um, four or five minutes left. So I was just wondering if I could just come to each of you for uh, a final thought about what you think is a, perhaps an achievable improvement that can, that can be... Um, that can happen in the next 12 months or so that you think will will help both continue to improve access and the um the the usefulness of online materials but also the something that you think is a, a, a tangible improvement that you, you're hoping to introduce at your institution over the next 12 months um at least you have any thoughts on that yeah, I think kind of um job content Matt earlier about the, the way that students may be using resources and kind of where people are at, how do we bring it together? So something we've really been asked from the students is um, how can we use these resources to improve our own self-assessment and kind of things like that. So I think that that's something I know that we want to work on more. I think it's more in how we're using these digital resources. How can we use them to ensure that the students feel that they can self-assess using them a bit more okay thank you um okay perhaps you, we are, we are perhaps already talked about this in terms of scalability but the, are there any other challenges that you think we can you'll be able to take the data from the way that the people are learning online now in order to help improve things over the next year or so um i think for me it, it a huge part of this is about access to resources um with some of the university partners I'm working with, especially in Africa, and where online um, libraries and subscriptions are just not, not an option. They're not, they don't have the money to invest. So looking very much at things like OER and how we can collate quality OER and improve OER and make that available, I think is, is going to be a big focus for us going forward and how we can work as a community to do that. Because again, like accessibility, we all benefit from that. And it's not to say that other platforms, sorry, Matt, and providers and things don't really, like they're great and they have their place, but they might not work for everyone, you know. So how, how can we get a, a good variety of things so everybody in the world can have have access to education and we can meet that sustainable development goal in that area and if we're talking about a tangible benefit I would like to introduce scratch and sniff so I can smell books from these devices okay all right well yeah Matt and the team working on that yeah I'm, I'm, I'm on it <laughs> um uh, Kirsty how about uh Life at Aberdeen is there is there a particular strategic goal that you hope, hope that's related to this that you're hoping to achieve in the next year um, I suppose for me, one of the areas I'd like to see moving, I think what this has opened up is that accessibility and the, um, I think Matt touched on it, that the, the, you know, there's all these different ways students can consume the same basic information. And actually it's not about um, disability that, you know, it, all students are choosing a way that works for them. And I think that's amazing. And we've seen that within our course pages. Um, I would like to take that one step further and make that 
um, how we do our assessments as well. So students can actually, instead of me saying you're going to produce a written piece, students will be able to make that choice of this is the learning outcome, this is the question you've got to answer. You can choose, do you want to do that as a piece of creative art? Do you want to do that as a written piece? Do you want to do that as a podcast? So enable us to take that same thing that we're learning that students like to consume the information in different ways to also allow them to start producing information in different ways and get to a point where people are comfortable that they can be equivalently assessed and um, so almost take the learning from this consumption side to the the actual production side from students okay thank you um matt we're very tight for time but i'll, I'll give you the last word if there's uh, anything you think is is you know bound or perhaps destined to improve the next 12 months I think the level of thought that's going into yet again for probably the third year in a row into how we can reimagine our environments and how we're teaching um, is, is, you know, is impressive. And I, I suspect that, you know, the points that were taken and the learning that was made from the pandemic and since, you know, since returning to campus and now with challenges around AI, we're certainly better suited to, to deal with flux and change. Um, I think one thing that I'm observing from, from many of the conversations I'm having is that universities are fo focusing far more on belonging and on giving students a sense of agency. And that's something that, you know, we as, as providers need to, you know, need to really enable so that we're, we're adding to that belonging, not just, um, you know, we're doing everything to break down, I guess, independent learning silos in many ways. Great, thank you very much. All right, that takes us up to time. So um, we will leave things there. Thank you very much to the panelists for joining me, to Kirsty, to Kate, to Matt, to Elise and to Matt, and for Playgo for partnering with us for this webinar. There will be an on-demand, recording of this put up on the Times Higher Education website. Everyone who's registered will also receive a link to that recording and a summary article with the key takeaway points in it. We hope that you found the discussion as useful and enlightening as I have, and we hope also that you will join us at future Times Higher Education events. So thank you to all our panellists and thank you to you for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>